Hello, my name's Andrew Collins, and I've been asked to uh, introduce our next two speakers. Uh, that's obviously Hugh Newman and JJ Ainsworth. Uh, obviously, now hold on, wait a minute, wait a minute, hold on. There's plenty of stuff to come before that. Uh, obviously, uh, Hugh is the, uh, the organiser of uh, Origins, uh, and also, of course, Megalithomania, which is at the other side of the year, as it were. Uh, and of course, uh, he's also a familiar face, uh, uh, like myself, on Ancient Aliens. Uh, and obviously J.J. Ainsworth over here is a researcher and explorer from the US who is an expert on ancient symbolism and connections between sites worldwide. Without further ado, I shall introduce my good friends Hugh and J.J. Now we have a 30 minute uh, part two of the presentation by the wonderful JJ Ainsworth. So please give her a warm round of applause. <laughs> Thank you. Can you all hear me okay? I'm from the south of the USA, so I talk kind of slow, but I'm going to try to speed it up for y'all. Um, so I'm going to talk about the Boyne Valley area of Ireland. Um, specifically Loft Crew, but also Newgrange, Nowth, and Douth, but focusing mainly on Loft Crew. And this is Newgrange, and I just want to show you a few images of that so you kind of know the area I'm talking about if you're not familiar with it. And this is one of the famous curbstones at Newgrange. And this is Douth, and it's kind of not in that great shape compared to the other sites of the Boyne Valley. And um, this is an aerial of Nowth, and it has amazing curbstones with all kinds of beautiful symbols. Okay, now this is Loft Crew, and it's Neolithic age structure dated to about 3300 BC. And this is just another view of that. Okay. So Love Crew has an interesting story attached to it involving a giantess, sometimes called Garavog, who came from the northwest with a collection of rocks she dropped from her white apron. Sometimes she's called Kalich, uh, forgive me for the pronunciations, which literally translates as old woman or hag, and it comes from the old Gaelic word for veld one. And anytime you hear veld one, Pay attention because this is sort of information that maybe has two or three meanings if you can understand what is being said. And most people don't, but it's a way of allegorical teaching. I'm going to talk a bit about um, her. I'm going to actually read a poem or a writing by Jonathan Swift, circa 1720, um, about the old hag or witch or giantess. Determine now her tomb to build, her ample skirt with stones she filled, and dropped a heap on Carn Moor, then stepped 1,000 yards to Lore, and dropped another goodly heap, and then with one prodigious leap, gained Carnbeg, and on its height displayed the wonders of her might. And when she approached death's awful doom, her chair was placed within the womb. So, it sounds like a really nice little story, but notice inside of that were mentions of uh, directions or lengths, and these are important. And in some stories, she has blue skin and one eye, which is not unlike the ancient stories of Cyclops, whom were also constructors or builders. She's an extremely ancient and powerful creator deity, uh, the Kalich is an ancient goddess of Ireland and Scotland who over time was sort of changed into what we now know as the ugly old witch. Um, so she's sometimes shown as a giant old woman who wears an apron and carries a basket on her back. Several mountains and hills were created when she dropped these rocks from her apron while leaping from these hills. And she sometimes held a hammer that shaped the earth. And at Loft Crew is this really large curbstone, but it's known as the Hag's Chair. And it has amazing symbols carved on it, which I'll talk about momentarily. And this is the size, this is me sitting on it, enjoying it. So it is quite large. And this is the entrance to Loft, uh, the Loft Grave 
passageway. And inside of it, it has many carvings along the walls and just all through it, even on the ceiling. And I, I luckily got to go inside and visit and examine it. And this image here on um, the right shows me at the special stone. It's called the Equinox Stone and it's Cairn T. And it is quite a small stone, but it is packed with really important symbols, which I'll talk about. And here's a better view of it. And um, Martin Brennan discovered that Karen T receives the beams of the rising sun on the spring and autumn equinoxes, which happens twice a year. And this is what you would see on, that day, on those days. So the light would shine down the passage and illuminate these really beautiful symbols, which I was... I haven't got to visit at that time, but I plan on trying to do so, and I encourage you to as well. Okay, so the next place I want to talk about is in Nevada in the USA, and it's called the Winnemucca Petroglyphs, and it's North America's oldest petroglyphs and could have been carved up to 14,800 years ago. And that is very old. And we know the dating is accurate because in 2013, um, a team of researchers from the University of Colorado at Boulder performed scientific tests which showed the age of the carvings to be between 14,800 and 10,500 years ago. Um, they lie within the Pyramid Lake Paiute Indian Reservation, uh, which makes the site hard to get to, and you have to get permission to visit. And I know somebody that's waited, still on a waiting list, three years to try to go. And this is me in front of one of my a couple of favorite uh, petroglyphs, and these are huge. They are not only the oldest, but they are so big in size, they might be the largest. And I need to note as well, that this is the stone it's carved on is tufa limestone and it used to be one really large piece but over time with its age it broke into pieces around and this site is also connected to the giant lore with the red-haired cannibalistic variety called the sitika which Hugh sometimes speaks about and also, there's a feminine giantess that sits watch over the area near the petroglyphs. She is known as the Stone Mother, and her story relates to the Paiute creation myth. And I took an excerpt from Brad Olson's book, Sacred Places of North America, and I'll read a bit of that to you. The story begins with the father of all Indians who lived on a mountain near Pyramid Lake, he married a good woman who bore him many children. The oldest boy was very cruel and was sent west with another daughter, while the nice children remained with their mother and became known as the Paiutes. The father returned to the mountains and then to the sky, but the mother grieved for her lost children, and she began crying bitterly every day. She sat on a mountain facing west, and her tears began to form a great lake beneath her. This became Pyramid Lake, and she sat for so long that she eventually turned to stone. There she remains to this day, sitting on the eastern shore, facing west with her basket by her side, guarding both it and the pyramid. Now, I am very interested any time I see a guardian figure watching over an another side relating to creation myths. And so it was striking to me that at the, in Egypt, the Sphinx guards the pyramids there, and also the Paiute creation myth in the USA, which is an older area, supposedly, than in Egypt. And here is a, just an image for you to see the Pyramid of Khafre in Egypt, and then at Pyramid Lake in Nevada, USA. It's quite, quite interesting. Um, so you can see how similar they are. But not only do the pyramids on the Giza Plateau have legends and stories of underground subterranean chambers, 
But the pyramid lake structure has the same tells told about it, and that's really interesting. So I'm going to get into some symbol comparisons. And I have to note that the Winnemucca ones are a bit difficult to see because of the type of stone it is. So I did some small illustrations, and I hope will help you. And this is my absolute favorite symbol at Winnemucca. And I have a few images of me just to show you the size. They are so big, and they are cut so deep into the rock. It, they wanted, whoever carved these, they wanted them to last, and they did. And this is that same symbol, just a bit of a close-up for you guys. And it's, um, this symbol itself is known worldwide as an att attribute of the elite, the rosette style. And here is the one on the Equinox Stone in Ireland at Loft Crew. And I'm showing you this uh, side by side so you can sort of see that I'm not embellishing or changing anything. So in Winnemucca, the oldest ones in the USA, on this one giant rock has all these amazing symbols. And all of the symbols that are in Loft Crew on that Equinox stone are located on the ones in Nevada, every single one. And that, that's really important. We don't know why that is, but to me, it maybe harkens back to some sort of older uh, hidden language or lost symbology saying something that was on a worldwide uh, scale. And next, um, these are just going to be images that are both on uh, Loft Crew and uh, Winnemucca. And because they're hard to see, I tried to, you can see the one that I just showed that looked like the rainbow pattern, and it, it is up there. I, I'm so sorry about the, the imagery, but also at um, Loft Crew on the Hag's Chair, the symbols are also there, matching, which is amazing to me. The whole site of Loft Crew and Winnemucca are connected. Um, and the symbol of the circle and the dot, which for Egypt we might call that the raw symbol, but it's at both places. And again, at Loft Crew and Winnemucca is the, I guess, sun pattern with a dot in it. It's very difficult to see. And at both places again is the zigzag pattern. And this pattern is related to the feminine. Um, it denotes water and, uh, well, serpent imagery as well. I'm not saying that snakes, women, whatever. Do you understand? <laughs> Sorry. But um, so here is another sort of leafy pattern at Winnemucca. And when you go to visit Winnemucca, it really is a magical place. I've never felt so in awe whenever I got to the site. It, it just felt, it was something unexpected for me. I'm a person that likes physical evidence, and when I went there, I was feeling a very strange sort of aura, and I've never had that experience before, so I know it's a really special site. And so the image here is showing the patterns at Winnemucca, Loft Crew. And here, the imagery I'm showing you, what might be shown is an acacia leaf, which has sort of shamanic properties if it's ingested or uh, made up a certain way. Now, I'm not sure if that's what it is, but you're <laughs> that's good. I feel better. <laughs> so. Here it is, if it, the acacia leaf I just showed you was sort of in stone. It looks very similar. So I'll just continue on here with some of the patterns at both places. And this is like a crest. And maybe this is a little bit better. This is Winnemucca and Loft Crew, the Hag's Chair. And this is sort of a flowery-like cross, and I can see at the Winnemucca one over there with the Tufa limestone, it is difficult, but believe me, it, it's the same. 
And then we have the um, cup and ring marks, or the cup marks that are, you know, many Neolithic sites have it, but for me, I just want to show that it is at uh, Loft Crew and at Winnemucca. And here is another uh, pattern, the exact same ones found at both locations. Okay, so here I am again at the Equinox Stone, and this is my favorite symbol on the Equinox Stone. And my favorite symbol at Winnemucca. Now, what I want to show here at Winnemucca is that above this rosette, this flower symbol, is a crest attached. Okay, this is a very uh, complex symbol. You don't see that everywhere. It's very unusual. And this crest is also on the Loft Crew Equinox Stone. So that, to me, speaks of a connection that really can't be denied. It's really important, and I'm still looking into the meaning of this, but when you research um, old writings and thing. It, it is, it's quite difficult, but I'm still going to research and have a part two to this, and I'll put it online for you guys if you're interested. So just another outline of the equinox crest at the top to show you that it is exact. And my next slides are just going to show you from the Boyne Valley and Winnemucca that all of the symbols that are there you will find in the USA at the site. And uh, the rhombus serpent feminine pattern, also in, uh, at Newgrange and um, Winnemucca. And this is the um, stone, the curbstone 52 that I took the previous image from. And this pattern is pretty much the same pattern at both Winnemucca and Newgrange, but it's a little bit stylized on the right. Um, maybe representing the three stars of Orion's belt on the wings, but I just call this the butterfly pattern because I, there's not really any name for it. And also, I would like to add a site to this grouping of symbols. And I'm just going to briefly mention this one, and it's in Paraguay. And it, too, contains all the same symbols that you... Uh, saw in the previous comparisons. And the site has the stories of the giants attached to it, which is interesting. Now, I don't research giants, I don't chase them, but when you go back researching old symbols, you run smack into it. So, I, you know, it's something I have to delve into. So this is one of the areas, the stone wall, the stone canvas, where they left their art, showing some of the symbols in Paraguay. Now, I've, I'd like you to know that I've, vin I've visited the Winnemucca Lake petroglyphs and the ones at Loft Crew several times, but I have not yet made it to the ones in Paraguay. So all I can do uh, for now is just use the images that I find on the internet, but I hope to make that journey soon and have my own photos. So the Paraguay here, um, listed, it has the same sort of leafy pattern, you know, from different artists portraying the same thing, it, it, it'll be changed a bit, but overall, the statistical, the mathematics of all the same symbols being on one stone at each site, I mean, you forget about it, they're connected. And again, at Paraguay, that we have these sort of rounded M's or zigzags, just like at all the other places. And here is me next to one of my favorite rounded zigzag ones. Winnemucca is just amazing. It really is. And we don't put up the GPS or anything uh, of the site because we want to protect it. And if you do get to visit it, I mean, you're going to have to apply to do so. But I. I really encourage you to, to do so. And um, at Paraguay, 
just like at the other two sites, we have the crest. Now, I'd like to continue on and talk a bit about the giants, but not too much. So, <laughs> the giants seem to still be out and about. So, this photo was taken at the summer solstice at Stonehenge. And I found this remarkable guy who looks very much like the giant that Merlin was directing to place the lintel stone. I asked him why he came, and he said he didn't really know. He felt compelled, and I thanked him and asked him to always come back. He was there, the giant hunter, didn't spot him. No. Nothing. <laughs> so, I am really curious as to why these sites across the globe have such similar stories surrounding their creation. And these stories attached are creation myths, like the stone mother, uh, the apron wearing giantess. It is not just creation of life, but maybe the earth itself. Um, and the symbols carved on all of these places on these stones relate to feminine aspects. Um, which is the life of the uh, biological form, but the earth itself as well. I'm so interested in this. And this just shows the area on the earth of the three sides, the distances I was talking about, in case you were curious. So, as I mentioned, I am really amazed about the same symbols at each site. So I don't know what's going on here. I'm going to research this until I find an answer, and I may never find the answer, but I won't stop. So I was wondering, is this like an allegorical code, a knowledge shared and cared for over thousands of years, yielding only to those who are chosen to receive the knowledge? Maybe. So as mentioned before about the aprons, uh, these aprons are usually involved with bags, baskets, megaliths, large stones. The term apron in relation to giants and other magical creatures shows up often. So I wanted to find out where the word apron came from. And I'm glad that I was curious. So I did a bit of the research and found out some very interesting and enlightening information. So the apron is apparently an old time knowledge. And if you go all the way back to Latin, you can trace the roots of apron to the word mappa, which means both tablecloth and map. So surveying, this apron is a tool. So often old maps were on leather or cloth. So if you spread your large map out on a table, it's a lot like a tablecloth is uh, why we have that today, the term tablecloth. And indeed, when you had accomplished your task with the cloth, you could quickly bundle it up, carry it away with you, uh, allegorically, whatever it contained, tools, seed, knowledge, perhaps. So I thought a bit about more th th than this, and I realized it's a, it is a story of ancient special beings possibly doing the surveying, the measuring, the building of the landscape, um, maybe even what we might call terraforming. So it's a hidden or lost secret knowledge that today we really can't even fathom the possibility of this because we think we know everything and we really don't. So in ancient Egypt, aprons were important as well. You would see um, aprons with the point upward shown when the wearer is performing some kind of ceremony or initiation. And that's the pyramid structure. So aprons were associated with shaman gods and goddesses, aprons of knowledge. So fertility goddess figurines may be the oldest depictions that we can see and relate to showing the example of the aprons. But coming up into modern times, if you recognize this, you will note that this is a Masonic um, apron. And on the chair to her right, is that symbol, my favorite symbol at Lafcru in Winnemucca, the rosette style, and she's pointing to the book. So to me, 
It is still contained in secret societies, but you have to pay a lot of attention to that. And again, just another of these sort of aprons with a lot of the symbols. And I myself am proud to be a Mason, an Eastern star. And this is a close-up of one of the um, aprons. And at the bottom, you can see the rosette, my favorite lovely symbol. And the acacia, or wheat, is also there. A lot of times you might see it and just say it's a wheat symbol, but we know we can interchange that with these uh, sort of shamanic... Um, you can intake it and have different visions, just different things like that. So, over here, from Syria and other places, I think that the true meaning is really lost today for these symbols, but you see these uh, images of the famous bird deity and guy carrying the pill or the bag of knowledge and wearing these aprons that are similar to what is worn today. So, even though a lot of the knowledge is gone and we only have a sliver i'm still going to look and i encourage you guys to do so as well and if you find something out email me please mm. yep so the rosette here was on one of the previous images arms there it's prominent and it's related to the elite as i mentioned previously so I'm not exactly sure, I can't explain what it is, but I am completely convinced that in the very, very ancient past, because almost 15,000 years ago, those symbols were carved in America. And then we have them in Ireland and Paraguay. So mainstream archaeology will tell us that there was no connections, that there was no crossings, but there had to have been, if we use our uh, knowledge today of mathematics and saying the amount of symbols at each site, and the complex one, like the crested rosettes, it's very important for us. And so I want to show you my last slide, I know you guys are probably hungry, is probably the best discovery that you will ever see. I know what Michael Jackson was after. A woman from the New Kingdom period of Egypt. So thank you guys very much, and I'm really glad you came. And I'm sorry about my southern drawl, but I hope it was understandable. Thank you, guys. <laughs>